Today's show is brought to you by BCB Group. You're going to be hearing more about them later on in the show. But for now, let's get into today's conversation. I am joined by Paul Hodges, founder of the PH Report and consultant at New Normal Consulting. Paul, welcome to Forward Guidance. Thank you very much, Jack. Paul, you have a background. You know so much about areas that almost no one. You're very, very niche. You know, I know we're going to talk a lot about energy today, but your your background is is in chemicals, right? Can you explain uh, why the world of chemicals can give people a glimpse, a forward glimpse into the, the global economy? Um, and yes, yeah, so explain explain sort of your background because I think it's pretty unique. Well, it, it, I suppose it is really. Um, it, I think the the issue with chemicals is that it's a very old business. Uh, it's been around a long time. And it's the third largest business in the world after uh, energy and agriculture. And it reaches into almost everything that uh, we touch and in every country. So if you, know, if you, if you look around your, your, your room or your office or something, you know, there's all sorts of chemicals and plastics and carpets and you know, PVC windows. And all, all these things are there. So we get a very, very broad view of what's happening. You know, we have to know about autos, we have to know about electronics, we have to know about housing, because that's our those are our, our markets, if you like. Equally, we have to know about oil, or we have to know about natural gas, or we have to know about diesel, and we have to, you know, and so on. So um what what you're seeing is on the one hand, you've got a, a, a breadth of, uh, of of coverage in terms of geography, and also a breadth in terms of the whole value chain. You know, if you're in the oil industry as such, you tend to think about exploration and and production and so on. You know, if somebody said to you, "Well, what's Unilever doing today?" You'd go, "Well, who are Unilever?" You know, it's that sort of thing. But in chemicals, you have to know about Unilever. And by the way, you've woken up this morning and you've just discovered that crude has gone up ten dollars. So you better know about that too. It also gives you a, an advance notice because. The, the chemical industry, it leads the economic cycle, right? It's not a laggard like so many industries. It, it, can you talk about that? We're, we're in the opposite position to employment. Um, you know, employment is well known to be a lagging indicator. In the, if things are going well, and they've been going well for a while, you know, people will hire more. If they're not going well, they'll hang on to people for a bit because they don't want to lose good people. But if it's still not going well, then they'll fire them. So it's a lagging indicator. It tells you where you've been. We're at the opposite end. I mean, this time last year, we were sort of you know, waving our arms around and shouting and screaming to anybody who would listen, you're going to have massive inflation. And people, of course, said, no, 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 don't be silly. You know, it's impossible. But we never had one. No, 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 really, we're going to have massive inflation because we were seeing it coming down the value chain and, and we were starting to pass on these enormous uh, price increases. Um, and and so, so that's our skill. And we're generally... Uh, you know, and I've been doing this a while, as you know, Jack. You know, we're generally six or nine months ahead of the street in terms of what's happening. So, you know, as I say, by this this time last year, we were talking about uh, the the idea of inflation. By the end of last year, it had become you know, pretty pretty clear to people. Yes, we've got inflation. What a surprise, and so on. And even the Federal Reserve, you know, this month woke up to the idea that, yes, there was inflation after all. It's not transitory after all, you know, and so on. Um, you know, we, we've been now saying for three, six months, well, actually, guys, we're in recession. We're really in recession. And we're in exactly the same position of people saying, oh, no, 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 no not, not really. No, the Fed, Fed is confident that, you know, that we're not going to be in recession. Oh, fine. Okay, whatever you think. <laughs> uh, Paul, so, th- you know, a year ago, you were seeing things in the chemical markets, I think elevation in prices of chemicals, that would make you indicate inflation is here, inflation is here. Because again, chemicals gives people a glimpse into what's coming. It's a leading indicator. What are you seeing now that is recessionary? And how confident are you that, that it's recessionary? We're very confident, uh, unfortunately. I mean, we don't want to be uh, to be pessimistic and t- talking about recession. And so we'd much rather be uh, upbeat. But you know, facts are facts. What we're really seeing, and this is the this is the key issue, is we, we look very closely at prices, and we also look very closely at whether those prices can be passed on or not. And there, you know, in life, you know, it, it, you might want to make things complicated, but actually, the more you know about something, the more obvious it becomes. And with oil prices rising, what happens with our 
chemical industry. And what happens in most, most places down the value chain is everybody sees prices rising and they say, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea just to put a bit more in stock in the warehouse, in the tank, on the shop shelf or whatever. And, you know, you talk to the finance director and the CFO and they say, yeah, interest rates are low. We've got plenty of money. Yeah, go ahead. Sounds good idea. So at first, as prices start to go up, it looks as though everything in the garden is rosy. You know, we're, we're putting up our prices and next month we're going to put them up some more and demand is really quite strong. And so each time this happens, and this has been a pattern you know, before my time, but going on, you know, that first happened in 1973 to four, happened in 1979 to 80, happened in 2000, in, uh, in 1990 with the first Gulf War, happened in two, 2000, happened in uh, 2008. Obviously, the first signs of this are all very positive. You know, we're very much cleverer. The energy intensity of what we're doing is, is much lower. We've got all these wonderful IT tools and so on. And, you know, uh, an old lag like, my, like myself and my team, you know, we sit here and we go, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> whatever. And the next thing that happens is you notice that people aren't able to pass through these prices anymore. And the crude oil, you know, as we've seen in the last two or, th two or three weeks, has gone up more and it's over 100 bucks and so on. But chemical prices haven't gone up. In fact, in some cases, the eth ethylene, uh, which is the big product, uh, in the in the states, it's two hundred billion dollars is spent on new ethylene capacity in the states to take advantage of shale gas and so on. Those prices have been falling, not rising. Oh, you say, what's that about? And the answer is that the sales guys are calling in to the purchasing meeting and saying, "Don't buy any more. We can't sell it." And just, I just had to ask, what, what is ethylene used for? Eth well, ethylene is the, is the biggest volume chemical. Ethylene goes into polyethylene. So um, anything that you get uh, from a store or from Amazon or anything like that is usually wrapped in, in, in film, some plastic film that's normally uh, uh, po po polyethylene. It's also, you know, all the buckets that you have, all, you know, a, a lot of the, the, the pla uh, a lot of the plastic tools that you have, if you have, uh, you know, picnic baskets and so on, all sorts of it's the main plastics, and most most plastics, one way or another, are are, are polyethylene. Okay, so it's it's not some niche chemical that only it's only this one industry use. It's pretty much, uh, you know, pervasive. So it it can almost be used as an economic indicator because you know people are using that uh, buying Amazon products. That that is demand. So the fact that that the price is it's that price is actually going down now, even as oil is going up. E ethylene is the biggest volume feedstock. Uh, in, in chemicals, polyethylene is the biggest volume volume product, and you know it's used all around the world, as you say. So if, if something's happening there, then you have to you, you, know, you have to take it as being important. So when we see a, a big headline inflation number, let's seven point nine percent for February, or, or probably higher for for March, a lot of that I know is oil. At, at what point are we going to see? the disinflationary dynamics that you're talking about. At what point are we going to stop see the oil price in a, in a headline inflation? And we're going to start to see the disinflation that you're seeing in the chemical prices. The remedy for high prices is high prices. And uh, what, you know, what we're seeing in chemicals now is what we would call demand destruction. And, and, and you know, some of the demand destruction you're seeing because of supply chain issues if you can't get hold of, uh, of of semiconductor chips, you can't make cars. We've discovered, um, and of course, uh, if you're trying to make cars in in Europe uh, and chips, you need neon. And it turns out that Ukraine makes ninety percent of the of the of the neon that's used in Europe, and so on. So there's all these things that none of us ever knew. I mean, the uh, the, the CEO of uh, Ford uh, this time last year, who's a thirty five year veteran with the company, and I think you know pretty well knows his stuff, and he said. Um, at the annual results, he said, I've learned more about our supply chain in the last three months than I have in 35 years. <laughs> I, I kind of suspect he, had, he wanted to add, and I really didn't want to know it, but... <laughs> Some things you don't learn until you have to. Exactly, you know, and so, uh, and even if you've worked your way up, you know, you haven't necessarily come... But, but what, so what you will see at some point 
But this is not a call for saying, you know, go out and sell this afternoon. It will be very dangerous. Uh, what you'll see at some point is that demand has been destroyed and you know, supply will come back and therefore you'll start to have more supply and less demand. And what you've got added to that is the demographics. And you, know, you and I have talked about this in the past. If you, you know, when we, we had this fantastic increase in the number of babies born after the war. In the States, we had a 52% increase in the number of babies born between 1946 and, uh, uh, and 1964 compared to the previous 18 years. Now, what do babies do? Well, first of all, they create quite a lot of demand. So, and, and you were coming out of the war. So, yes, you had to turn your factories back from making tanks and so on into making refrigerators and so on. But and in the normal course of events, you've probably been a bit slow versus the demand surge. People, you know, five years of not having anything rather would like something. You've got, you've got some uh, pent-up demand there. But in, in this occasion, you were dealing with a 52% increase. So, of course, demand spiraled out of control. It could only be controlled by higher prices. So, of course, you've got inflation. However, by the time you get to the early 80s, those babies born in 46 to 64 start, they finish their college, they finish their apprenticeships, and they start to go into the workforce. So they, you're now in this sweet spot for 20 or 30 years where they're going into work and they're creating demand because they're settling down and they're maybe having babies and they're buying houses and buying cars and all those sort of things. And at the same time, they're working. So they're creating more supply. So you have continually deflationary conditions for 30 odd years. Inflationary conditions, right? Paul, sorry, Inf inflationary conditions, right? No, no deflationary, deflationary conditions. Right. Because, well, so what, what I mean is, is that you know, we started with inflation in the teens, and we ended up with inflation pretty near zero. Oh, uh, yes, yes. So, so dis disinflation, uh, if, 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 if you like. And now, obviously, we've got what I think is short-term uh, disruption and therefore short-term inflation, which doesn't mean that it means it's going to happen for a week or two. So you're going to, you, you've had the, the Fed has now pivoted, and the Fed is, I think, going to increase rates quite a lot because Jay Powell has been told by Joe Manchin, I'm not voting to confirm you unless you focus on inflation. And as Upton Sinclair said uh, in his failed bid for uh, governor of uh, California in, in 34, you know, the great, uh, the great writer, uh, you know, it's very hard to persuade a man of something that's true if, it's, if his salary depends on something else. <laughs> you know, Jay Powell had to sit there with Donald Trump and say, yes, sir, please, sir, I want to be chairman. Well, in that case, you get that stock market revving up, my boy. Don't worry, sir, I'm on the job. And now he's got uh, the mansion saying, well, if you want my vote, you want to stay in the job, you've got to go for inflation. Yes, sir, whatever you say, sir. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I, you know, you may sound a bit cynical, but yeah, the facts speak for themselves. You know, at one point, you've got a guy who has put $2 trillion into uh, stimulus. And now you've got a guy who's saying, well, I might, you know, might raise interest rates by half a percent next time. You know, the, the, two, the two things don't work. But uh, underlying this is you've got now the benefit of, for, for, for individuals, of people living 15 years longer than in 1945. So you've got now, in for the next 20 or 30 years, you're going to have more uh, the, the majority of population increase in the states and in, more in the world um, in the, the over 55s versus the under 55s. Their majority of, of growth in population, but of course they already own most of what they need. And of course, they're moving into retirement, so they have less cash. So you, you will now see at some point that you go into deflation. How severely is are the price shocks in commodities in oil, but in particular natural gas, which you know Germany, you know the majority of of, of, of uh, Germany's natural gas comes from Russia. How se severe of a you know, economic wound is that inflicting on on Europe? What we're looking at is this uh, incredible uh, coalition that's developed. Uh, you know, I, I saw that Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, uh, uh, said. Uh, you know, we never expected that sanctions would come along in this way. No, you didn't. I mean, what, what, what? You know, Donald Trump did his best to destroy NATO as a mutual defence thing. He said, you know, I don't want any more, and so on and so forth. At one stroke, 
Putin has brought NATO back into being. You know, Biden is going to NATO meetings. Everyone is turning up. Everyone wants to join NATO. Right. This is a complete turnaround. And, and, the, and the, the, the sense of if you attack one of us, you attack all of us. Um, and, and so what we're seeing, there's enormous pressure now on companies not to buy from Russia. You know, Germany is still buying off the, the, uh, the original Nord Stream pipeline and the other ones. But there's questions about can you actually make payment for it, given what's happened on SWIFT? Can you actually get insurance for it? You know, I talk to my friends in the insurance industry in you know in, in Boston and so on, and, uh, and 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 in London. Uh, you know, they're not clear that it's legal anymore to offer insurance. Uh, so I don't think it's a moving situation. I don't think that Germany will actually stop buying gas because that is fifty percent of its demand, and I think that that would uh, you know, that, that that would be brave. Uh, because so, <laughs> you know, the economy would, would grind to a halt. Um, but you're certainly seeing major reduction in, in use. And also, if you look at the oil markets, you know, Russian oil is moving because, of course, if you give people enough incentive, they always find a way of doing it and they change registrations and change bills of lading and all this sort of stuff, as we've seen ever since apartheid uh, in the 70s and 80s onwards. So, but Russian euros, as far as one can tell, uh, is selling at about a $30 discount to the market. Uh, so it's still profitable for Russia, but it is still moving. There's so much uncertainty in the oil market. I, I asked you uh, recently, you know, what I foolishly asked you for a price forecast, and you said it could be anywhere between $200 and $500. Why is there so much uncertainty? And also, could you, could you paint a little bit of color on the bull case is obvious. The price of oil continues to accelerate higher as there's no supply. OPEC shut the taps off. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the war may continue. But explain the bear case to me as well. Right. Well, I mean, what I was saying is on the upside, um, you know, it, it, you know th there are forecasts out there of anywhere between 200 and 500. Pierre Anderan, you know, one of the most successful traders uh, this week, was talking about 250 plus, right? Um, so double, you know. Uh, double what's happened because he thinks that Russian oil will end up disappearing from the market. On the other hand, uh, Ed Morse at, uh, at City, uh, I've got, uh, also got great respect for, uh, interviewed by the uh, Financial Times, uh, said, I think it's going to go down to 60 because he actually, and the reason for him, nothing to do with Russia or anything else, he actually sees what's happening in China as a big negative for the oil market. And he, you know, he sees China. He actually says, you know, I think I think China's oil imports will will reduce very significantly. And so, if China isn't buying any oil, then you know that balances whatever's happening in Russia. So, uh, but but then you say, and it's a very good question. So, okay, you've got two people who normally one would you know one would take seriously: Ed at sixty and Pierre at two hundred and fifty. Hmm. Uh, that's quite a wide range. You know, what, what, what does this mean? And so I think that what, and this highlights something about where we are, you know, we, we call ourselves new normal consulting. And there is a reason uh, for that, which is that we see ourselves, we see a number of paradigm shifts taking us forward at the moment. And we're moving into, therefore, a, a different world from the one that you and I have grown up and worked in. So you know Ed's call is is perfectly perfectly sensible at sixty. Where we are today is obviously perfectly sensible because that's where we are. And then you've got Pierre talking about double today's prices, and what what he's saying is, I think that the Russian uh, Russian oil will disappear from the market. So that's two and a half million barrels gone. St stocks inventories are low. He doesn't see uh, China uh, collapsing. In that way than it does. And so he says, as you get towards winter, you're therefore going to be very, very short on oil. And so uh, that, that creates your problem. And, and, I, and therefore, what I've try, tried to say, Jack, is I, I think a reasonable person has to say all three of those options are credible.
it sounds like you don't necessarily have a view on where it's going, but you think that the range of possible outcomes, maybe the the volatility will be severe. What we're seeing is that I mean, WTI obviously went negative uh, two years ago. Uh, that was great fun if you were on the right side of it, but uh, of course they cancelled all the contracts, so you didn't really make the money you hoped. Uh, one of those things. Um, the uh, you know, and, and from that point, if you took a look at Brent, which didn't go negative, obviously you've moved up from you know the twenties to the hundred and tens. Well, actually, we went up to hundred and uh, nearly hundred and thirty. Uh, at, at, at one point. So you've had a, a pretty big, almost a tenfold increase. Uh, if you look at interest rates, the 10-year bond, it's gone from a low of about 0.4% up to about 2.4%. Now, it, it, that, those are remarkable moves in a two-year span. And so logic says that kind of volatility is going to stay. And, and there are lots of reasons why there should be that volatility. You're at war, for example. None of us have any experience, thank God, of having been at war. You know, uh, the last time America was, was, was really in a big war uh, was obviously Vietnam. Uh, you know, and none, none of us remember that. Um, poor Madeleine Albright uh, did, of course. Um, you know, Kissinger uh, still does. You know, but there's, there's not many around like that. So we haven't got experience of, of, of what happens in a war, but wars are generally inflationary. You know, that seems to be. End of wars are generally deflationary. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think anyone looking at a, a portfolio has to assume that what they've been doing very successfully for the last 20 or 30 years probably won't work in the future. And then you say, OK, right, I, I'm keen to learn. What is it that I need to look at? And that's why I was so, you know, I think you have to look at what are the, the possible options here, uh, you know, in crude, could be 60, could be 120, could be 250, reasonable arguments for all of those. How do I know what will happen? Well, I'm going to keep watching. I'm going to keep watching on, uh, on, on, uh, on China. I'm going to keep watching uh, on Russia. Most of all, I think, at the moment, I'm going to keep watching somebody that you know m m many people m may not have really ever heard of, uh, a chap called Olaf Scholz, a German chancellor, just become German chancellor. You know, he took over from Angela Merkel, who was there 16 years. Unsurprisingly, not many people have heard of him. But he delivered this, and I, I've never used the word before, he delivered a historic speech to the German parliament uh, at the end of February, where he basically overturned the entire post-war German policy. He said, no, we're sending arms to Ukraine. He said, you know, uh, on, on energy, we're not going to do Ostpolitik anymore. Ostpolitik was the idea that if we work with the Soviet Union in the 60s and 70s and 80s, over time, we would bring them into our system and the communist system would collapse. And indeed it did. And that obviously encouraged people to say, well, you know, if we do more of that, it will work better. But what they missed, and what Schultz was very clear about, was they missed that when Putin began to not only take over, but to develop his concept of restoring the Soviet Union, and you know, saying, oh, the Soviet Union you know, was the worst catastrophe of the 20th, 20th century, you know, one, which one says, well, hang on, Mr. Putin, it wasn't the worst catastrophe for you. Because you started as a KGB officer and you've now become one of the wealthiest men in the world. You know, and it may be a catastrophe for somebody else, but it wasn't, you know, I'm not quite sure why you're seeing it that way. Um, so, uh, you know, the, 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 but there, there he is. And now you have to undo Nord Stream 2, obviously. I don't think gas will ever flow down Nord Stream 2. You've got to unwind your dependence, 50% of German gas coming on Nord Stream 1. So, and so you have this remarkable. I mean, you can't you 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 can't overstate the the site. You had the German Environment and Economy and Energy uh, Minister going to the UAE and bowing to the Emir and signing contracts for natural gas, and they are a green, a leading green politician. So the whole concept of we're we don't want any fossil fuels at all overnight. 
you know, we either have some fossil fuels or the country shuts down. I mean, this, that's why I call it historic. And, and I think, therefore, one has to watch Olaf Schultz really carefully because, I mean, uh, Macron, obviously, in France is an important player, but Germany is the key economy in Europe. And, and more importantly, if France and Germany are working together, then Schultz has enormous power. This episode is brought to you by BCB Group, Europe's leading provider of crypto-friendly business banking for institutions in the crypto space. They also provide trading services, allowing you to trade FX and cryptocurrency quickly and at scale. They specialize in efficient execution of large orders in illiquid markets. So if you are an institution looking to make high volume trades, you need to check out BCB Group because a great trade idea is worth nothing if you can't execute it. And that is exactly what BCB Group helps you to do. Their mission is to empower the global financial revolution through sustainable and innovative banking. Really glad to have them as a sponsor. So if you want to take control of your digital assets, please check them out at bcbgroup.com slash jack. That's bcbgroup.com slash jack. Thank you. And let's get back to the show. Why is it so significant that they turned to, to fossil fuels? You know, th This had been a, a party that had uh, spurned coal, oil, natural gas, even nuclear Right. Mm. And so, so yeah. it, it is very significant that they, they turn to fossil fuels. And also, can you explain uh, how do you think this will shape the future path of the transition to green energy? Do you think it will speed it up or do you think it will uh, slow it down? Because it, because it will remind politicians you know, how important fossil fuels are. So there's two, two answers really to your, your question here, Jack. Uh, the first, I think, is that it's if you like, a welcome dose of reality. Uh, I'd rather it hadn't happened in this particular way. I'd rather that people had been a bit more sensible and far-sighted, but they weren't. They were, you know, they, uh, uh, you know, they, they were kind of able to play games here and pretend that actually you could move from here to there with renewables overnight, with no planning, with no pain, with nothing and so on and so forth. And we're so pure we're not going to accept compromises. Well, sorry, you know, in a family, one has to accept compromises. So, you know, in a country, you have to accept, and on policy, you have to accept compromises. Not everybody gets what they want all the time. So it, it is very significant that the Green Party in Germany, which was the, you know, the most successful Green Party in Europe, probably in the world, uh, has actually recognized reality and said, okay, we now have to think seriously about energy policy, not just about renewables. Then there's a second question. And uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the head of the uh, European Commission, and indeed uh, last week, the International Energy Agency, uh, came out and, and, and really also reminded us that this isn't the first time that the West has been held to ransom by fossil fuel producers. You know, we, we had it in, in 73 to 4 uh, with the Arab oil boycott, and the states had lines of people queuing up for gas at service stations. We had it again in 79, 80, and going on over the, uh, uh, over the Iran problem. We had it uh, again with Iraq and the first Gulf War. Uh, you know, so, so we have been held ransom quite a bit. And you have to ask yourself, Today, do we have to be held ransom? Now, the shale was obviously a very good solution for the states, and the state, you know, that makes the states independent, more or less. It still is importing, but it, it's no longer the big importer uh, that, it, that it was. So you could argue, well, the states is all right, too. The rest of the world isn't. And so if, if you want the West and the Western economy to be viable, without being held to ransom, or rather, is there a way that it could be viable and not be held to ransom? And the answer is yes, there is, which is to move to renewables. Now, the issue with that is that for quite some time, obviously, you have to duplicate. So you're building out wind and solar, and you, you know, I, I would do nuclear, but you know, that, that, that's, that's for, for discussion. If you like, but it's focused on wind and solar. Now we know that the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. So what do you do? You can't just have wind and solar 
I mean, you know, in Portugal, uh, where I live, you know, we're, we're, we're at about 45% renewables today. And by 2030, the policy is to move to 100%. But it doesn't stop there. It actually moves by 2040, current policy, to 145%. Because you need, you know, it depends where you are, how many days in the year, you know, if it's 65 days in the year that it doesn't blow hard enough and it doesn't shine uh, strongly enough, then what is your backup for that? You have to have backup. So you have got to have oversupply. So, so you go through a period where you duplicate what you're doing. And then after that, you, you have an interesting energy market. And you know, Portugal and Scandinavia, I think, will be one of the first to see this, where for a lot of time, you have free electricity because you've got the wind and the solar. It doesn't cost you anything. You're not using any resources. They're just turning around and so on. And so your energy electricity is, is basically free. And then for the 65 days, say, when you, there isn't enough sun, then you start to pay higher prices. Now, that's a completely different business model, but it's very interesting for businesses because there are quite a lot of businesses that say, well, as long as you could give me a few hours notice, I can, you know, I, I can run when it's free and I can close down when it's not and I'll build stock, you know, to, uh, to do that. So, um, so there, there is a big opportunity here, but you have to have a sensible discussion with people and they have to understand that the first one, first time, is you're, you're going to duplicate. Walk us through uh, a German energy solution, uh, what would look like over the next year? Because, you know, the, let's say the 2023 winter is an intense winter. How are energy prices not going to spike through? What, you know, where are they getting the oil, the natural gas? Are they getting it from shale in the U.S.? Are they getting it from the Middle East? Uh, walk us through that. And, and why do you think it's possible? Well, I, I, th I think I'd start uh, by, by quoting the, the Irish phrase, well, I, I, if, if you want to go there, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and, I, and I, I really mean it. This is, not, this is not a good place to be. And it's going to be, uh, you know, a, a lot of touch and go here. But what you, what you have to do, I mean, and Schultz in his, in his speech, made this up, he said, got, we're going to put in two new LNG gas terminals. And he said where they're going to be and so on. So LNG, basically you take natural gas, you pressurize it so that it can go in a ship, uh, liquid up, and then, then, then you, uh, you gasify it again and you put it into a pipeline and, and there you are. Now, we don't know how long that could take, you know, if you've got what, a major government behind you, but at the you know, moment that's four years. That's no use really uh, for the for the winter. What you can do is you can use, and this is already done. Uh, you you can use LNG carriers to gasify. So in other words, you you park a as it were, you park a, a carrier there, you fill it with, uh, with with LNG from a ship coming in. It does the gasification and it links to the pipeline on the shore, and that's the kind of Heath Robinson uh, solution. What do you mean, Heath Robinson? Sorry, sorry, it's a, a British, a British phrase. Um, it's uh, I, what, what, what I mean is, it's put together with string and elastic bands, and you keep your fingers crossed that it will all work. <laughs> okay, it's, it's Heath Robinson. Okay, that makes sense. And you think that's that's plausible? I, I mean, scientifically, I take your word for it that that it is possible. But do you think it's possible that, that there can be enough ships to supply the the huge lack uh, that was missing from Russia? Well, I, I, I don't think that. I mean, what the IEA said, uh, and you know, they're, you know, they're a pretty sensible bunch of people, is you've got to cut down demand. So on the oil side, which they were looking at, you know, you, you, you turn your thermostats down and gas, you know, if you're using gas heating, you, you turn your thermostats down. You put on more jumpers. Uh, you, you drive, you, you know, you have car-free Sundays. Uh, you drive, and this is all, all these things have been done in the past, so there's no reason why they shouldn't be done again. You know, you say car, car with an odd number uh, odd number plate can drive on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and, and Sunday, and cars with even numbers can drive on uh, Tuesday, th Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Uh, you know, if you have a family with two two two, two car right, right way around, you're okay. If not, you're not. Um, you know, th th all these things are, are are doable. The the issue is we are in a war, and I, I, I'm I'm reminded of 
you know, what the states did after Pearl Harbor. And, you know, it was taking months to build ships. And FDR said, well, we haven't got months to build ships. We have to, we have, to have Liberty boats. And so they set two docks at work, on one on the Atlantic, one on the Pacific coast, because you needed some there and you needed some there. And, and pretty soon they got it down. They were, they were turning out new Liberty boats every six days. Now, I don't know what the cost was, but I do know that the cost of not doing that was unbearable. So, you know, it, so if, if the German government says this has to be done, you know, you get the best people in the world alongside you. You get the best technology alongside you. As I say, the technology is already known. This is already, you know, there are 20 or so, I think, um, LNG carriers acting as gasifiers at the moment. So it's not a new technology, but normally you'd take two years to do it. You've actually got six months. And you think it's likely that that strategy will prevail of sourcing natural gas from other sources? You, you, you believe in the Schultz solution, not the Onderon solution. It's more likely. I am, I am by nature optimistic. And so I, I, I have to believe that uh, yeah, there's lots of evidence to show that the Germans have lost their skill for delivering on time. You know, it took 10 years to deliver the new airport in Berlin. You know, it took God knows how long to deliver the new uh, opera house in Hamburg and so on. Uh, even the trains don't run on time anymore. So, you know, I, I can see that people are cynical about this. But, you know, from my discussions, you know, over the last three or four weeks, I think there is a new mood in Germany. We have to do this. And let's face it, they've got all the support they would need to do it. So I just hope they don't let us down. And Paul, do you think that this will accelerate the transition to renewables? Some per- they, they were going to buy a Peugeot, a, a, a gas guzzling Peugeot. Now they're going to buy an electric car. They're going to buy a Volkswagen. They're going to buy a Chevy Volt, a, a Tesla. Uh, how significant do you think that will be on the margin? And you know, do you think 10 years from now, when everyone's driving electric cars, do you think we'll look at this moment as saying, wow, this really sped things up? If there wasn't an energy crisis, maybe people would still be driving uh, gas cars. Even before all this happened, what what we were seeing was that by 2030, there would be no sales of gasoline or diesel cars in Europe. That was highly likely to have become the legal position. It's already the legal position in the UK and certain other uh, countries. And most of the car companies have already said that's what our objective is going to be. So uh, at that point, what you'll look, what you'll be looking at, is a a, a move to you know, sort of accelerate this, but also, of course, with the high price of oil and gas, that means that it becomes very expensive to run a petrol or a, a diesel uh, car, and so there's a cost advantage which will help to encourage people to move forward. Now, you're going to say yes, but also some of the cost of batteries and so on have gone up, and I agree. But what the IA said was, governments, just subsidise it, please. Don't be stupid. Just make sure this is a temporary thing for two or three years. Just pay the money, you know, because this is more important. The energy security. And so really what you're, what you're suggesting here, I think is right, Jack, that what's happened is that the move to electrification and net zero has also now been linked to energy security. And that is a fundamental paradigm shift and one that the International Energy Agency has adopted, that governments are going to adopt, and will therefore be, you know, we will look back and we'll say, at that moment, that it became irreversible. Energy price shocks usually precede recessions. And I know that uh, you, you have a view on the economic impact of the surge in the price of oil, natural gas, uh, do you think that it makes recession more likely or or is your case on recession more to do with what you're seeing in the chemicals market and oil just sort of makes it all the more likely? Well, I, I, I think the oil, the oil position is, is the rationale for what we're seeing. And so, uh, you know, we, we, we look back a history. We use the BP uh, data, which uh, you know, is very good going back to 1861. Uh, so probably a long enough timescale. And what you see is that whenever oil prices 
get to be above around 3% of global GDP, you go into recession, typically. And there's only one exception, which was in the sort of 2012, 2013 period, where the central banks were pumping out trillions of dollars. So, you know, so if you say, tell me all, oh, I think they'll go back to pumping out trillions of dollars again. Okay, fine. But, uh, you know, I, I take back my claim. But otherwise, every single time you get to this point, you have a recession. So me, to me, uh, you know, we're up nearly 4% uh, today. So to me, and, and I should add, we've also got gas prices at extraordinarily high levels as well. Not necessarily in the States. The States were higher in, uh, in, in sort of the mid, uh, mid 2000s, but in Europe and elsewhere, they're much higher than they've ever been before. So you know, you've got an immense energy market hit. And, and that's, that's really a, a very simple thing in that you look at discretionary and non-discretionary spend. So you know, we all have a certain amount of money uh, that we earn and that we've got. And if oil prices are low, that means we can buy some other things that we'd, we'd like to buy. If oil prices are high, well, we have to heat our home. If you're living in Houston in the summer, you have to cool it. Uh, it's unbearable otherwise. Uh, you have to drive the kids to school. Uh, you have to drive to work yourself. And a lot more people obviously are driving at the moment because they're worried about going in public transport and so on. So, uh, so you've got their non-discretionary spend and you say, well, I've got 100 bucks and 75 of it is now being spent on all of this with housing. So I haven't got so much to spend on anything else. And that takes you into recession. And it, it, is, it is an in, inevitable uh, conclusion. Uh, and all we're, all we're really seeing from the chemical industry is that happening, that playing out six months earlier, because what we're seeing is, or we have been seeing uh, since, the, since the fall, is that actually people have been unable to pass these prices on down the chain, which tells you that there, you know, that, that, you know, there is a demand destruction going on. You talked earlier about recessionary risk, high oil prices causing recession. What you're seeing in the chemical markets indicates that disinflation is is on the horizon. If you are right about those two facts, wouldn't inflation moderate by itself, therefore relieving pressure off of Jerome Powell to the point that maybe Joe Manchin calls Jay Powell and says, "Hey, great job," you know? And in that case, wouldn't the Federal Reserve's wouldn't the Powell put be back in full force? This goes right back to the start of our conversation, Jack, because this is this is around. You know, my fundamental belief is that we are in a deflationary world, but nothing is ever in a straight line. So we're in a deflationary world because we've got aging populations, because people like myself, who are absolutely lovely people, uh, don't actually buy a lot. Uh, you know, we. Uh, uh, you know, I think I think I mentioned. Earlier, you know, the only pent up demand in our family is from my wife for diamonds. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I've resisted this temptation on and off quite, quite successfully. I'm, I'm prepared to continue. You know? But we're, we, you know, we, we don't need to go and buy new stuff because we're having babies anymore. And, you know, the, you know people of our age, you know, we might buy something for the grandchildren, if you like. But you know, that, de that demand has gone that drove the, the economy. So what we're seeing today is the impact of you know, the sort of two horsemen of the of the apocalypse, if you like. Uh, first of all, we had the uh, the, 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 the the plague uh, in terms of COVID, and then sec sec secondly, uh, we're seeing all the disruption that's going on, and and war, obviously, and thirdly, we're going to get the third horseman of the apocalypse, unfortunately, almost certainly. Which is famine, because Russia and Ukraine are twenty nine percent of world wheat supplies. Russia is blockading wheat ships loaded ships loaded with wheat at the moment. Won't let them sail. And you know, if the war does go on, then there won't be many farmers in the Ukraine actually going out and sowing seeds. And anyway, the other side of the coin is that with very high natural gas prices, fertilizer is made from natural gas. And farmers can't afford to buy fertilizer and fertilize their crops, so crop yields will be down. You know, the only reason, you know, the, the population of this world has gone from 2.5 billion to 7.9 billion since the war, more than three times up. What's caused that? The use of, you know, one of the main things has been the use of nitrogen fertilizer. You know, that doubled, basically doubled yields. Without that, 
we, we wouldn't have had this population increase. There are other, th- other factors as well, but that's one of the key factors here. And now, you know, when I talk to farmers, because after all, chemicals is, is goes into agrochemicals, fertilizer, seeds, pesticides, and so on. So I've got a very wide range of people that we can potentially talk to. And they all say, well, farmers are cutting back because they can't afford to buy the fertilizer. So you're going to have a double hit here. You're going to have parts of the world, unfortunately, that are like Egypt. It imports 80% of its wheat. Well, how much will it get? I don't know. Egypt doesn't know. You know, you're, you're going to see potentially, as I say, the third horseman. You know, you've, you've, you've had plague, you've had war. Now you're going to have famine. Um, and you're going to have that in other parts of the world. And you're going to have higher food prices. So, uh, you know, we haven't seen that impact yet in the markets. Well, we've seen some of it, but we haven't seen it in the shops. But that would argue to me that inflation will not be stopping anytime soon because it takes quite a long time for a farm. You know, we're living on the food that was produced from last year. Now the farmer is going out to plant for next season and that won't be therefore coming in to the shops. I'm glad you laid that out that your de- disinflationary view, your recessionary view, it's, it's not going to happen overnight. And actually I'm thinking I can sort of have the... Fed fund the the futures interest rate futures curve in my mind and how there's a little bit of a of a dip indicating that policymakers actually could or could be inclined to cut rates in 2023 to 2024. Does that align with with your thinking indicating that you know we we're in this inflationary world for 12 to 18 more months, but then that's when the shoe really drops and we enter a severe recession that would would cause central bankers to cut rates rather than hike. I actually think we're entering a severe recession now. Just to be clear, okay. you know, that, that's what we're seeing, that people cannot, you know, for the last six months, people have not been able to afford the prices that are being charged. We can't, That's what I mean by they can't be passed through. So we are now in recession. An inflationary recession? An inflationary recession. So we've got high inflation, prices have gone up, and for the last six months, we in the chemical industry have not been able to pass those prices through. QED, demand, destruction is underway, we are in recession. Now, the next stage of this is, see, well, my, my next answer to you, Jack, is I don't think anybody's going to care about the Federal Reserve in a year or two's time. They're irrelevant. You know, it, it, when, I, when I started work, you never had stock market channels. You never had, you know, on the main news, this is what the Dow has done or whatever. It, was, it just it was irrelevant. The, the the Federal Reserve was not there to you know to to run the economy. That was due to the guys in D.C. That was guys the guys in Westminster in the Elysee Palace and so on. You know, how can I mean the the concept is ridiculous. How can twelve men and women and four hundred PhD economists guide the economic fortunes of seven point nine billion people? by raising or lowering interest rates by a quarter or half a percent. I mean, you know, if you, if you submitted this as a, as a storyline to a publisher, he'd say, don't be so stupid, nobody might believe that, right? But you know, because it was correlation, not causation, the demographics meant that it appeared that they were doing this great job, that they were contributing, they were disinflation, constant growth, non-inflationary, constant expansion, the nice period. That, uh, that people talked about. It's nothing to do with them. I mean, that Paul Volcker is a very nice guy. Don't get me wrong. You know, I, I know people who knew, who knew Paul, Paul Volcker. And, you know, he certainly was leaning on the right side to help the thing happen. Uh, uh, you know, very bright, very, very nice guy. Um, can't say the same of uh, some of his successors. But anyway, uh, you don't have to be nice. Um, but the, the, the issue that we face today is what's happening in the real world. Because if you look at the what the Fed has done, and the central banks have done, is they've taken a theory from Milton Friedman and put it into models. And when the model doesn't seem to be... Well, that you know, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. That, you know, I, it's correlation. It's not, you know, I say it's, it's all about demographics. It's about supply and demand. Isn't that obviously untrue, given that 
you know, uh, if you have the price of oil go to $130, suddenly we have 8% inflation. And as people are talking about the supply chain constraints, isn't it obvious that supply chain plays some role in it? You would have hoped so. You would have hoped that, you know, after, you know, sort of uh, 10 years of constant monetary stimulation, you know, until, you know, the the, uh, COVID came along the pandemic, you didn't have any inflation at all. You would have hoped that people, but they didn't, they haven't changed them. And, and what they're saying today, why does Jay Powell tell you? Why does Christine Lajard tell you? Why do the Bank of England, the Bank of England, they're still looking at these models and the model tells them, no, no, there's no inflation. Oh, sorry, there's, there's, there's no recession. So, you know, so, so the, the, and, and then you look out the window and you see prices going up and they say, oh, no, no, but that, you know, the real world is wrong. That's good. Prices going up is good because it indi- indicates rem- robust demand. Exactly. That, you know, that, you know, it, it, exactly. So, um, so I all I'm all I'm really saying is this: this has been a rather wasted period, uh, if you like. We could have done a lot better if the central banks had just stayed with their original role, which was to sort out um, sort out uh, problems. But we must come back, therefore, to the CLOs because this is the big problem: that what they've done with all this cash. Whereas, where has this $8 trillion of cash gone? It's gone into M&A, mergers and acquisitions. Has it gone into sensible mergers and acquisitions? No, it's gone to private equity. Private equity has bid up prices to absurd levels. You know, it used to say that if you've got a reasonable company, you, the value of the company was around its revenue. Right? You don't have that today. Yeah. You, you, have, you have people buying 10, 15 times EBITDA. What is EBITDA? Earnings before the bad stuff. You're not even counting interest. You're not even counting you know, taxes or depreciation or whatever. You know, and and, and what, what, what's, even, what's even worse is you have 20% of companies, according to Deutsche Bank, in the S&P 500 who cannot pay their interest bills. And how did this happen? Well, you poured out all this money, no questions asked, at low interest rates. Because interest rates are so low, you've got a lot of people, pension funds and so on, Desperate for yield, so they get. And what 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 you do is you construct as they did with housing with subprime. With subprime, they rolled all the mortgages together and called them collateralized debt obligations. And they said, well, if you put them all together, then you know, some of them will go wrong, some of them will be all right. So if you buy the the safest tranche, you'll always be okay. And Alan Greenspan went along with this and said, there's never been a national house price crash, so there can't be one. Two things don't follow, but that's not what Alan said. And so then, of course, there was. You know, when I lived in Houston, house prices crashed in half between 85 and 86, but prices in Chicago went up. It was right. But if you've done loans to people who can't afford to buy the house, then when prices crash, they all crash. Similarly now, these CLOs, and people are starting to take notice of them, you've put together this package and you sell them to the pension funds and to others, and you say, well, this one, Jack, very, very safe. It's the top tier. You know, this one down here, if you're feeling like a little frisky, you know, you could get double the interest rate. You know, which which do you want in your portfolio? But, you know, you can't you, you can't buy 10-year bonds because they were leading 0.4%. So this looked okay. You know, it's 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 safe, and I'm getting 3%, or it's a bit bit, bit riskier, and I'm getting 7 or 10%. Oh, sorry, if, if, I, if I may. So the little bit of that's riskier, that may be triple B, that, that whole tr- uh, package of that CLO yeah. is rated triple B. That will earn 6%. The triple A, it only earns 3%, but it's triple A. It's, it's completely safe. However, if you zoom in, that triple A thing does not own triple A loans. It owns uh, triple C, double B, single B, double B, uh, tri- uh, triple B. So the the reason that you can do that is because oh it's diversified and it has all of all of these things but just because something's rated AAA does not mean that it consists of AAA securities. Sorry, Paul. It, that, that is, it, it's absolutely right. And I, I mean, I was just using the interest rates for illustration purposes. They're not actual illustration uh, rates. They've, they've moved around obviously quite a bit. But the, the the point is that if you've got a fundamentally flawed model where you're lending to companies who cannot pay their interest bill out of profits and are dependent on rolling over their loan, if you get to a period where nobody wants to roll over loans or they only want to roll them over at a much higher interest rate, those zombie companies go bust. And once 
one set of zombie companies goes bust, as we've seen with the property developers in China, once you begin to think the emperor has no clothes, now you begin to say, and this is the phrase, if you like, we've been, for most of our our investment lives, looking for you know, return on capital. You know, at the end of the day, the market's always been growing, demand has always been growing, the central banks have always been standing by. So you know, what we do is we just say, oh, you know, have you got a bit of a tip for me, Jack? Could you do this and so on? And now what we're doing, particularly if you're in China, and this will come elsewhere, is we'll go back to worrying about return of capital. Dear Ben Graham, you know, the father of security analysis, the intelligent investor, you know, the book that everybody ought to reread or read for the first time. You know, what does he do? He talks about margin of security. Well, <laughs> how ridiculous, you know, who needs security, you know? But my, well, I worked for what was then the largest company in the UK, the second largest chemical company in the world after DuPont called ICI. And, you know, we were very, very large. We were in pharmaceuticals, we were in paints, we were in petrochemicals, we were in fibres, very, very diversified all around the world. Imperial chemical industry was the old British Empire. Uh, we had a bit in the, in the States as well, just for old time's sake. And we never had a debt to equity ratio of more than 35%. Yeah, what a, what a ridiculous waste of a balance sheet you would say today. Yeah, what a, yeah. What a, what a so capitally inefficient, no, Paul. Completely. You've got a pile on the deck. You know, if you're not at 150, you know, you're just not doing the job. But what happens when you're at 150 and suddenly you lose 10% of your sales? You go bust. Simple economics. You know, I, I, went, I went, went to business school with a professor from Chicago who explained it all to us. You know, leverage is great on the upside, and when it's on the downside, you you, you die, literally. And, and so that is the risk that we've, we've had these CLOs, which are the icing on the cake of this world that says, you're never, ever going to see a downturn. Well, <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> so you said the 20% of companies in the S&P 500 can't pay their interest expense. That's the S&P 500. That's the cream of the crop. The private equity companies that you're talking about, private equity, they borrow a bunch of money they to to buy companies that are profitable that can generate free cash flow to pay off the debt. They saddle those companies with themselves 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 with debt and then those loans are packaged into CLOs which are sold to investors. Um Paul I don't know if, if you've uh, read the movie The Big Short or mm. seen the read the book The Big Short. I've seen, but... seen the movie of the book. Yes. <laughs> yes, seen the movie of the book. Yes, uh, that's what I love doing. Uh, sort of the first thirty percent of the book is investors talking about these problems and saying, "What are you kidding me? The FICO score is below five hundred and fifty. This this is insanity." Uh, however, the mar- the market persists, and the, despite the insanity. The, you know, it's the people who are finding fault who are, are wrong because the market hasn't turned yet. I actually started learned about C- CLOs in 2020, and I started doing a little bit of work, and that's how I, you know, started digging into. Oh, this thing is called AAA, and by the way, all the CLOs they have st- strange names like stalactite or or you know Magnus. So it's crazy. Like, where do you get these names from anyway? And that's why I know that the AAA things had all these you know triple C, triple B things uh, in in there. But since then, the CLO market hasn't collapsed. And, and Paul, I'm actually uh, out of the loop with regards to CLOs by about a year. Can you catch me up? Has there been any pain with regards to the CLOs? You know, While the, the party is still going on, everybody stands around saying, oh, Yabu sucks, you're stupid. I'm the one with the money. You know, I, I, I remember uh, one of our colleagues, uh, D- Daniel, uh, who, who writes from uh, Hong Kong, is an investment banker. And in 2008, we had our usual Asian conference in Singapore. And I was chatting to him before he spoke. And he said, you know, strange thing happened to me as I was leaving the office. The secretary ran after me and said, oh, Daniel, uh, there's X. Uh, you know, he's got some paperwork for you for this this, this loan uh, uh, investment. Uh, he just wants to talk to you about it. Oh, all right, I'll, I'll give him five minutes. I've got a plane to catch. I'm already late. So he said, the guy says, look, it's only it's, it's only 500 million, he said. Uh, but I can't, I can't read all this paperwork, he said. Is this a good thing or not? And Daniel said, well, yeah, we think it's a good thing. Okay, thanks. That's all I wanted to know. Um, <laughs> 500 million 
due diligence was calling the investment banker, you know, to so that he repeat what he'd already told you. you know, and, and Daniel said, said, you know, of that particular deal, I think, you know, I think it was a good, it is a good deal. He said, but it tells you this market is going to crash. Well, that, those were his words. And, you know, when, 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 it, when, it, when, it, when he left uh, Investment Bank, that's, that's why we were so delighted uh, that, that he could join us. And, uh, you know, so we haven't seen that, that moment yet, uh, or maybe we have, and I just haven't noticed it. Um, but, you know, what that, and that's why I'm saying, I think that what we've seen is the Bear Stearns moment, which is Evergrande going down. But a lot of people will say, well, that's China. You know, that's all very different, isn't it? That couldn't happen here. And, you know, I mean, I'd be interested to know, you know, how, how many people have actually, like yourself, looked at CLOs. You know, in with the subprime deal, you had people like Paul McCulley at PIMCO who were going into CDOs in great detail and explaining that they couldn't possibly work. And, you know, PIMCO knew what it was talking about and set up a special subprime unit and so on. I haven't seen anyone, uh, maybe they see this interview, they could get in touch. I haven't seen anyone doing the same about CLOs. So it could just be that this is one of those things that suddenly happens one morning and almost nobody knows what's going on. Paul, you, you said earlier that you were an optimist. I, I need you to prove it because you have, <laughs> you've been talking, it uh, sounds like a lot of gloomy things that you see on the horizon. Uh, what, you know, what do you see that is not uh, bad news, that is not sad? I'm relatively relaxed about downturns because you know, they are a natural cleansing process. I'm very cross with the central banks because they've interrupted that on this you know, megalomaniac idea that they could somehow control the economy and you would never have a downturn again. Well, you know, you, you, you've stored up a lot of misery for people that was unnecessary if you just done, let, let the market do its job. I believe in markets. However, what happened last year makes me very positive for the future, not the immediate future, but longer term, around net zero, around the, uh, the, the climate change agenda, around the move to electric vehicles, around the move to renewables, around the move to a completely, you know, a much more sustainable and circular way of life, recycled plastics, much more recycling, much more of a local business where instead of throwing everything out in the trash can and going into landfill, you actually separate it out and you reuse it again. You know, that, that to me is A, much better for the world, but B, is going to create the most amazing opportunities for companies and investors. And you know you've you've started to see some of those things coming through, but and some you know obviously there's a hype stage and then they collapse, but then they come back again and and so on. But uh, you know this is if if I was if I was young if I was your your age today, I would be fantastically enthusiastic about what was going to happen over the next twenty or thirty years because I think these trends are there. There is money behind them. There will be bumps in the road, but as long as you stick to it. You'll do fantastically. I, you know, I wasn't optimistic a couple of years ago. I felt, you know, we're playing around in this area, but now we are. And, you know, this is where Putin has done us all a favor because we've realized that we have to go for this net zero agenda. And it's not a matter of, of guesses or whatever, you know, or, or choice. You know, there is no choice. We have to do it. And once you know you have to do it, then you've got, you know, the great American uh, enthusiasm, you know, the can do mentality, uh, you know. It, it, it works. Those opportunities you said for investors in this green future, net zero, where are they? Not even in terms of technology, but in terms of an asset class, because you know, green investing for the past 15 years in the States has amounted to pretty much these uh, asset gathering firms bundled together in ETF. And it's, it's pretty much the S&P 500, except it doesn't have ExxonMobil in it. And suddenly it's green. You know, I imagine that that's not the opportunities that you're talking about. What are you talking about? Yeah, you're you're ab absolutely spot on there, Jack. Uh, no, I mean, all this box talking and, and, and greenwashing. What, what, I'm, what I'm also optimistic about is that I don't think you can. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I like Jack Bogle very much. And, uh, you know, I had some very friendly conversations with him when he was alive. And, and he started something that was, I thought was really very good news, that there were markets where I wanted to invest, but I, you know, I didn't know enough about the companies to do it. But he set up an ETF for me to be able to do that. And that was fantastic. 
what Jack, I don't think, ever dreamed of was that the ETF would become the main force in the market alongside the algorithms, just, you know, spoofing and so on, as I see it, you know, uh, the, the, the great uh, Lewis book uh, on them. And, uh, you know, so what I think we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to go back to investing where we actually learn about the companies and we make judgments about them. Uh, you know, Peter Lynch, he was great, uh, great, you know, a great mentor to me, you know, from his books and his articles and so on. You know, he always said that the individual has an enormous inside track versus Wall Street because they see what's happening at first hand six or nine months before the street gets around to it. You see that a particular item is selling out like mad in your stores and everybody you know is buying it. That news doesn't get to Wall Street till next year. So you might be early, you might have to wait a bit, but if you do your research and you understand the bit of the market that you're talking about, then you will find. So we have, you know, the, the corollary of what I'm saying is that you do use the Ben Graham methodology and you don't do day trading and you don't go onto Reddit and find out what everybody else is doing. It's more, you know, investing is hard work, you know, but I don't mind investing in hard work. Um, you know, if you don't want to do it, well, find yourself a wealth manager who's going to do it. You know, we have lots of clients who are good wealth managers, <laughs> you know, we, you know that, that we work with. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of, of personal choice here. There are certain, but that, that's the way it has to be. The, the stock market has never been about, for me at any rate, overnight success. It's been about getting to know what do I, over the years, I've learned about companies, I've dealt with companies, I've dealt with managements, and I think to myself, hey, you know, Jack, Jack really knows what he's doing there. He really does. And he's in an industry which is doing pretty well as well. Because you know, there's there is the rule of you know, if if you put a good manager in a bad industry, it's the reputation of the industry that comes out for, ahead. Uh, so you know, you've got to look at this and say, well, you know, would you like to be in electric vehicles? Yes, I probably would. Is it probably overvalued today? Yes, it probably is. Uh, but you know, I'm going to keep an eye on it for when I think it's at a reasonable. Uh, reasonable price and you know which of GM and Ford and Tesla and Chrysler and so on are the ones that I want to go or is there another one you know Tesla can come from nowhere with electric vehicles maybe others can come from nowhere what about Rivian what about Lucid and so on and and, and you can pretty soon and we do this in our auto report every three months you know we look at all these developments around in the in the states in China in uh, and there's some fantastic opportunities to operate. You know, we are great believers, for example, in battery swapping. We think that this is going to be the future, that it isn't going to be individual batteries anymore. You're going to actually have a, a system, and there are people doing this already on the West Coast and you know, some big companies. Uh, BP is doing it in China now. Um, so uh, you know, where, where, where you simply call into this service station and it automatically replaces the battery while you go and uh, get a cup of coffee or... Go, go 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 to the men's room or, or, or restrooms. So, uh, you know, there, there are all these technologies out there. And the great thing is that as individuals, we can all get to a point where we're comfortable that we understand what's happening and we're comfortable whether we think there's a market for it. Because we can, you know, we can talk to you. Somebody comes along with battery swapping and you explain it to all your friends and they say, well, I'm never going to use it. You think, okay, well, probably Paul wasn't right about that one then. You know, but if they go, you know, then, you know, and, and so you've, you've got this ability to develop your own investment thesis and to check it out with people rather than momentum. Uh, I think that's a really good lesson to, to leave with. And I'm glad that you saved the the, the sort of advice, the, the words of wisdom um, for the end. Paul, you've been very generous with your time and your insights. Uh, I, re I really got a lot of this conversation. I know our audience did as well. Um, thank you everyone for watching. Please make sure to uh, subscribe to Blockworks so you could see more videos. Uh, Paul, you know, people can find you on Twitter at Paul Hodges one. Can you tell the, um, them a little bit about new normal consulting and the type of research you do? You know, it's, it's chemicals, but it's, it's broader than that, right? We call the report, the pH report. And uh, those who've done chemistry will understand the you know, pH. We call it the litmus test for the global economy. And so we claim to have a, a sort of inside track on developments six to nine months 
before they get to the wider wider market and, be, and become obvious. And so, um, you know, that's what we do. We also, I mean, we produce a monthly report, uh, which goes to corporates, goes to investors, We've got quite a lot of investors uh, in the States, we private and uh, and and investment banks. So we'd love to have some more, of course. And we also do consulting work. So if people want to know more about a particular area, uh, we've got a you know, very experienced team, uh, you know, several hundred years of experience in these areas. Uh, and uh, and so we can, we can we can often help. Paul, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you very much.